movie night. Put 37 books on my TBR. Next up, I have an unpopular opinion. I'm about to give you a hot take. Hey guys, it's Leanna and I'm here today with movie night. So I know this is a booktube channel, but spooky season is, is blah. Spooky season is my favorite time of year. And I very unwisely put 37 books on my TBR, which means I can't watch any of my favorite spooky season watches because I'm very, very busy reading. So instead, I'm just gonna tell y'all about them. So you guys can go watch them for me. <laughs> um, I have 30 things on my list and I know this isn't all the things because I just kept adding to the list. And then I created separate lists because like one was on my computer and one was on my phone and I couldn't be arsed to get my computer. So I started a fresh list. So like, I'm pretty sure I have more than 30 things that I, like to watch in spooky season, but well, we're going with 30 today. So there's uh, some of the things on the list are like totally Halloween classics that you've probably heard of, probably seen them. You probably also are like, yes, that's one of my favorite Halloween things to watch. But I have some things on the list that I always think that may be very, very possibly new to you. And some things that like you wouldn't necessarily maybe think of automatically as a Halloween movie or Halloween show or whatever, but I'm gonna make a good case. I'm gonna convince you that it is actually a good Halloween movie. So um, I'm just gonna read them off in the order that I've thought of them. So first on my list is Casper. Casper the Friendly Ghost, the original with Christina Ricci. That movie, <laughs> you ever wanna see me cry? There's, there's a lot of things that make me cry. Honestly, your best bet is always anything to do with Peter Pan. Casper the Friendly Ghost is obviously a Halloween movie. I don't need to explain why. I just wanna gush about it. And I will probably squeeze that movie in because I love it so much. So I will make time for it. I will sacrifice a book that I won't get read because of Casper watching. If you've never seen it, you should see it. I think it still holds up. Even like the effects of like how to do the ghosts, Casper and his uncles are pretty good. Like they don't look bad. I mean, we could do it a little better nowadays, but it still looks pretty solid. If you feel like crying on Halloween, <laughs> Casper is a great movie for that, but it's also like really funny and uh, lots of dad jokes in Casper. So number two, we're already hitting something that you probably wouldn't have thought of or put on your list, but Pushing Daisies, the show. I just love that show and I'm so sad that it was canceled after two seasons. But if you've never seen it, in particular, I would say the Halloween episode is, you know, obviously a great thing to watch around Halloween time. But in general, the show is about a pie maker who can raise the dead, but if he lets them stay alive for longer than a minute, then something else equal and opposite has to die to like, to balance it out. This private detective finds out about this ability that he has. So he decides that they should work together because being a private detective is so much easier if you can just like ask a victim who killed them. So the pie maker and his like, partner, Emerson Codd, they wake up dead bodies to find out who killed them and try to make money off of it. But it's like really sweet and charming and cartoonish. Like the dead bodies, like if you were killed by like, if like a car ran you over, then it looks like like a Looney Tunes version where you're like flattened out into like a pancake. Like it's like very silly. And then there's like a little romance between uh, Ned and uh, this his childhood friend who she is actually dead and he alived her again. And if he ever touches her again, she'll be dead again because if he alives again a thing, then if he touches it again, it goes back to dead. So anyway, it's a quirky, charming, weird, slightly macabre show because they keep waking up dead people and dead people are walking around and his girlfriend is technically the undead. They have whole conversations about how like, you know, she doesn't want to be called undead. She doesn't want to be un anything. And uh, maybe she can just be called alive again. <laughs> but I mean, in essence, he has a dead girlfriend. So you see why I feel like this is a good spooky season watch? I mean, some of the episodes I'll grant you are kind of very summery and pretty and you know, whatever. But the Halloween episode is one of my favorite episodes. And just in general, the show is very charming. Um, so I recommend you watch it so that you can be sad with me that it was canceled. <laughs> Next, I have something that I bet most of you haven't heard of. Um, it's a mini series called The Living and the Dead. And I think it was originally done on like BBC or ITV or something like that, one of those. And then I think at some point they might have aired it on PBS in America. I don't know, I'm pretty sure I saw it on like a streaming service, like a, that shows British stuff. Anyway, 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 it is, I think in six parts. And to my knowledge, it's not based on a book. Like a lot of these types of things usually are based on some classic novel, this isn't. Oh, it's kind of a tough one to explain. This man with his wife moves, I believe he's moving back to his ancestral home or it's just a brand new house he's never lived in before. I can't remember if he's coming back or it's his first time living there, but regardless, he and his wife move 
to this very rural house in the countryside. Um, and it's around like sort of harvest time. So you have all of this sort of like fall vibes of like gathering the harvest and people with like rural traditions surrounding harvest time. So like that version of fall and and Halloween vibes, you know, like the scarecrows and this sort of thing. But there's uh, sort of apparitions of the dead that keep like being a problem. And our main character, I think he's like a psychologist or something like that. I have, I, I can't remember now, but so he's a, you know, a man of science. So he doesn't believe like that there can be ghosts or anything like that. And he thinks there's always, you know, a reasonable explanation. And so there's kind of like an episodic nature where like in sort of each of these episodes, there's some kind of a mysterious thing that's hanging around that's like a ghost-like thing. And, you, and they're trying to figure out what this is or why it's here or why there would be a haunting. And there's usually some... You know, figuring out what person who was alive might have unfinished business and that kind of thing. But there's an overarching mystery and an overarching thing that is unexplained. <laughs> or unexplainable that is a part of it. It's a standalone series, so it wraps up at the end. Your questions are answered as much as they're ever going to be. And it's just, it's very vibey and spooky and sinister. My favorite style of Halloween is rural. My favorite style of Christmas is rural. I like the idea of like cornfields with a ghost <laughs> and like uh, folk legends, like the local lore, the local spooky stories, the haunted farmhouse, this kind of thing. So if you like that, I highly, highly recommend Living in the Dead. Oh, and it has great music very good music, very like set the scene type music. Uh, next on my list is a new addition to my list and that is Miss Peregrine's Hell for Peculiar Children. I've already watched it this movie season kind of because I watched it the movie after finally reading the book and um, I saw the movie when it came out and I remember not really loving it and now that I read the book I didn't love the book <laughs> so I was like well let's see how the movie goes and the movie I don't know why I didn't like it and I mean I didn't dislike it when I first saw it. I just remember being underwhelmed and uh, I really really enjoyed the movie this time so honestly like I think it's gonna become like a yearly watch for me around Halloween time because like it's got this very sort of gothic Tim Burton vibe because it's done by Tim Burton and the children are you know sweet but creepy everything about it is just such a good Halloween vibe that yeah, and I mean, I love everything with Ava Green in it. It's actually, it's a really good movie and it's, it's quite dark. So yeah, Miss Peregrine's Home. I don't know why I didn't like. I've added it to my list. You should add it to yours. Next up I have Coraline. I know Coraline doesn't take place in the fall, but who cares? That doesn't define what a Halloween movie is. Like, slashers don't necessarily take place in the fall while people watch around Halloween. So I don't want to hear any of that. Coraline is terrifying. <laughs> The book is terrifying. The movie is terrifying. I know it's for kids, but it scares the bejesus out of me. So if you've never seen Coraline, this is a great time to do it. It is perfect for spooky season. I guess I'd say it's for the whole family, except honestly, like, it scares me as an adult, so I'm just saying. If you don't know anything about Coraline, the film is done by Leica Studios, which is one of my favorite studios. They do these amazing stop action movies that are just like from a technical standpoint, an absolute masterpiece. The Coraline the movie is based on Coraline the book by Neil Gaiman, where this young girl moves with her family to this new house and um, she's bored because her parents are ignoring her. So she finds, she's like roaming around the house and she finds this little like doorway that's like to nowhere. It's like a leftover from when the houses were, um, it's like a duplex and like when they were like combined or, or when they were split into two and like that, now the door goes nowhere. It's just still there. Except when Coraline opens the door, it does go somewhere. It goes to this sort of like weird other mirror world that's like our own world, but not. And there she has her other mother and her other father. And it all seems wonderful over there. A little too wonderful. I mean, I think it's probably widely known what Coraline is about, but nevertheless, I don't want to spoil it in case you haven't seen it. So definitely check out Coraline if you have not. And if you have checked it out, well then here's your reminder. Tis the season to watch Coraline. Next up is another stop action movie, Corpse Bride. Is it my Tim Burton? Anyway, Corpse Bride, I like better than Nightmare Before Christmas. I know, kill me. And I, I mean, I like Nightmare Before Christmas, don't get me wrong, but I like Corpse Bride better, which is I know is an unpopular opinion. I also think I feel less confusion about Corpse Bride because Nightmare Before Christmas, I'm what if it's like, if I'm watching it during Halloween time, I'm like, this is too dang Christmassy. And then if I watch it around Christmas time, I'm like, this is too dang Halloween-y. So there's just like never a time when I feel like super comfortable with it. Like maybe on like, November 1st, 
when I'm fresh off of spooky season, but I'm willing to consider that we're approaching Christmas season, maybe? But mostly I'm just like, I just, I am confusion when I watch Nightmare Before Christmas. Corpse Bride, love it. I love the humor, I love the songs. I love the just the general music of it. I love the look of it. I love the story of it. If you've never seen Corpse Bride, highly recommend. I mean, it's the same style as Nightmare Before Christmas. So again, it's much like with Coraline, I, from a technical standpoint, it's a masterpiece. And yeah, I just love Corpse Bride. So check it out. Next up is something that's probably already on your list or you probably already saw it. You've probably definitely heard of it. Probably definitely. The Haunting of Bly Manor. I watched this last year when it came out on Netflix, as did like The Nation. So this is not news to you, <laughs> probably, but I am just giving it my seal of approval. I really, really enjoyed Haunting of Bly Manor. I then went and read Turn of the Screw, which is what it's inspired by. And I was like, Haunting of Bly Manor is way better. So if you haven't seen Haunting of Bly Manor, it's got my seal of approval. I have not watched The Haunting of Hill House because I'm too chicken. But I have talked my brother into watching Haunting of Hill House with me because I wanted to see it. Oh, I mean, ever since it came out, I've just been too chicken. I don't know why I decided. I guess I heard a lot of people who had seen Hill House complain that Bly Manor wasn't scary enough. And I was like, okay, I can watch Bly Manor. And Bly Manor is not scary at all, really, in my opinion. It has like a few like startling moments, but it's not scary. The point being, I do want to watch Hill House. And so I've talked my brother into it and he's like, okay, I'll watch it with you. So this this month it's happening so i can't tell you if it's blind manners better than hill house maybe hill house will be on my list next year probably will be since everyone says it's great but i can tell you the blind manner is great and even though i don't think it's scary it is very spooky and it has all that sort of like gothic eerie unsettling vibes and it's more of a sort of like emotional psychological thriller. Uh, it's, it, it is a haunting story. I mean, I know it's called The Haunting of Bly Manor. When people say like a haunting melody, Bly Manor is haunting in that way. It sort of stays with you and it is more sad than scary, but it is nevertheless, again, dark and spooky. So Haunting of Bly Manor, watch it. Next time I listen to something that I guarantee, I guarantee no one has guessed that it's on this list. Slaughterhouse Rules. <laughs> I would even guess that most of you probably haven't, haven't even heard of Slaughterhouse Rules. It's a movie with Simon Pegg. I don't know if it was done by Simon Pegg the way that Shaun of the Dead was, but he's definitely one of the major characters in it. And it's in the style of those movies. So even if it isn't a Simon Pegg movie, it is a Simon Pegg movie for all intents and purposes as a viewer. So Slaughterhouse Rules um is it is an elite british boarding school and at this school they're fracking <laughs> like the to make money the school has agreed to let them you know drill for oil on the the lands that school's built on so there's these like elite kids like our main character he's you know a poor kid who got in to us a, a slot that opened up um because uh well the guy died who was at the school so he shows up and he's you know trying to figure out what the school's all about and then learns about this fracking. And then um, it seems like they might have unearthed something that's not oil when they were fracking, like a literal monster, which is now attacking the students at the school. So it's like horror comedy, comedy horror. I mean, it is quite gory, I'm not gonna lie, but it is very cartoonishly gory, but it is genuinely gory. Like Pushing Daisies is like sweet and charming. This is not sweet and charming, it is gnarly, but it's like played for laughs. Arm being torn off and it's bloody, but everyone's like, ah, that kind of vibe. I've watched it several times. I honestly really love that movie just generally, but Halloween is a great time to watch. What is in essence, it's kind of, I guess, like a slasher. Kinda, maybe, sort of, ish. I don't really know what a slasher is. But Slaughterhouse Rules, great movie, watch it. Next two on my list I'm gonna do together because like, I don't know, they seem like the same thing. I almost wanted to be like, you can't put both on your list. Pick one and I'm like, why the fuck not? So Sleepy Hollow and Sweeney Todd, both directed by Tim Burton, both starring Johnny Depp. <laughs> so if you haven't seen, Sleepy Hollow is the older of the two, obviously, maybe not obviously, but Sleepy Hollow, the movie by Tim Burton, takes the legend of Sleepy Hollow by Washington Irving and sort of really expands on it and kind of gives it some more lore and gives it more of a full story because it's quite a short story originally. Ichabod is no longer a school teacher. He's there to sort of investigate the, the deaths that are occurring in Sleepy Hollow that are caused by the Headless Horseman. I mean, I'm explaining it good because I feel like a duty to, but I'm assuming you've seen Sleepy Hollow or you at least know what it's about. <laughs> it's another movie that I really feel like holds up, uh, even though it's a little bit older. So like some of the effects are like a little dated, but I mean, they built an entire, like the forest of Sleepy Hollow is a sound studio. They built that entire forest in a sound studio. 
so they could control you know sort of all of the gnarly looking trees and all of the like weird lighting and the fog effects and I just you know it's an it's another one of those movies where like it is quite gory at times and I was quite scared of it when I was a kid I mean not a little kid I wasn't allowed to see it when I was a little kid but like I was when I first saw it I was like a, a bit scared of some of the parts of it but overall I mean the costumes are amazing Johnny Depp is kind of hilarious and quirky as Ichabod Crane Christina Ricci is wonderful there's like a lot of famous like basically like you know all of those British actors that are in Harry Potter movies they're like all in it at some point and it's just it's a real Halloweeny movie you know there's like jack-o-lanterns everywhere it's one of the most classic Halloween stories it's got this amazing soundtrack which I'm pretty sure is Danny Elfman because isn't it always Danny Elfman it might not be I'm not sure but even if it's not Danny Elfman it's got that vibe so it's great and the Sweeney Todd the demon barber of Fleet Street well for one I think is one of the most successful stage to film adaptations of a musical. I'm about to give you a hot take, but I think Tim Burton would have been a better choice as a director for the film adaptation of Les Mis than what's the fuck his name is, Tom Hooper? Um, because Tim Burton demonstrates an understanding of the medium of film and how the medium of film needs to be used and how it can do things the stage cannot and that it, there are things it cannot do that the stage does and what are its strengths and how to adapt a stage play for film that plays to film's strengths. That doesn't make it a good spooky movie, that just makes it a good movie. It's a great musical. I love Sondheim's lyrics. It's one of the most macabre musicals there is. I mean, if you don't know the story of Sweeney Todd, he is, he and Mrs. Lovett have like a deal going where he kills all the people, not all the people, but he kills the people that come to him for a shave and then she bakes them into pies and sells them. So good to go. There's obviously more to the story than that as to like the motivations behind this and then just generally things going on but that's that's who Sweeney Todd is if you didn't know so I don't think I need to explain why that would be a good Halloween time movie. And the songs are great and you can just sing them the whole rest of October because they will be stuck in your head. Next up I have Penny Dreadful the show the original show. I never actually saw the new one. It didn't look very good and I heard it wasn't very good. Penny Dreadful the original show on Showtime? I'm pretty sure. It had three seasons and Penny Dreadful, if you haven't seen it, if you don't know what it is, it's tanking basically characters and figures from gothic literature and from Penny Dreadfuls, which were like tales of suspense and horror that cost a penny back in the Victorian era. And it sort of like mashes them all together into like one big story. So you have main characters and there's an overarching plot and a thing that they're trying to trying to achieve or trying to discover, but they are constantly meeting with and interacting with and coming upon characters like Dracula or Victor Frankenstein or, or Frankenstein's monster. Do I think, do they do a Jekyll and, yeah, they, yeah, they do Jekyll and Hyde. And yeah, just like a lot of ooky spooky things. And it is basically like the show just, I like the story and I like the actors, but the aesthetic of it, honestly, like it could just be like, a gothic Halloween time ambiance on YouTube because at all times it is just black lace and the memento mori and the it's just it just looks like you know haunted mansion vibes so it is just a very vibey show and if you want that if you want to feel like you're in a haunted house basically like a Victorian manor where there's like demons and spookies and there's corsets and there's whatever oh there's also a werewolf <laughs> then it's perfect it is literally perfect for October next up I have over the garden wall which I've already watched like three times <laughs> this spooky season if you haven't seen over the garden wall you're missing out it is so charming I keep forcing other people to watch it that's mainly why I've seen it so many times already because I wanted to watch it so I just watched it and then my brother had never seen it, so I made him watch it. And then my friend had never seen it, so I made her watch it. My mom had never seen it, so then I made her start watching it. Anyway, this was a cartoon miniseries uh, on Cartoon Network some years ago. It has quite a voice cast, like Elijah Wood and John Cleese and Christopher Lloyd. Um, and it's basically a story of two brothers who get lost in the great unknown in the woods. And they're trying to find their way home. And so each little episode, because they're quite short, is something along the way. Some quirky, bizarre, hilarious, but somewhat sinister sometimes, sort of stop along the way, where it's someone that they think could help them or someone that they're uh, trying to run from or whatever. That's what that little episode is about as they keep making their way and trying to find their way home. It really has the feel of sort of just like old folklore and like old stories. And it has a very quirky sense of humor that 
I guess you either love or you hate. And if you love, it's great. And yeah, it's just a charming little show that is quite unique and really stands out both in the art style of the animation, which is a big draw for it. There's a lot of um, weird little songs in it and it's just, it's just so charming. So highly recommend. It's not a big investment of time either because like the episodes are super short. So you can just kind of like watch one here and there as you wish, or just binge the whole thing, also a great option. Next up, I have a classic, Interview with a Vampire. I love that movie. I, I guess it gets criticized. I just think it's great. And it is, I mean, those are vampire vampires. Brad Pitt is phenomenal as Louis. Tom Cruise is amazing as Lestat. And not just like, I mean, he's amazing as Lestat, and it's also amazing that it's Tom Cruise, because he's so not Tom Cruise as Lestat. It's just so outside of the kind of character that he usually plays. And he's really good and in this character, in this role. Kristen Dunst is amazing as this like little girl who's like matures into a woman, but it remains in the body of a little girl. She's very convincing at that. Antonio Banderas is in it. And if you don't know what Interview of the Vampire is, well, <laughs> it's based on the classic book by Anne Rice, a modern classic, I should say. And um, in essence, in the present day, Christian Slater, who is, he's a journalist, he has the opportunity to interview a vampire, Louis, Brad Pitt. And so Brad Pitt, Louis, the vampire, is going to tell Christian Slater his story from birth to rebirth as a vampire up to the present moment. And so it goes way back in time to the bayou and most of the story takes place sort of in the past until we finally catch up to the present and it is a twisted dark tale and it is just dripping with scenery. Every single shot is just so lush and the acting does not hold back. They are just so vampire-y. It's just so much vampirism going on. And the performances I think really are quite excellent. Um, I recommend. Next up I have a movie that I saw for the first time last year and loved it. I think I watched it twice um, and that is Blade two. So Blade one I had seen years before and had not liked it and I rewatched it last year because I was dressing as Blade for Halloween or for our Blades of Water's Purpose live show and I was like I should do my character research. So I watched Blade one again and I was like this movie is not very good. But everyone was saying that Blade two is so much better and Blade two is directed by Guillermo del Toro and it is almost like a standalone like it kind of reboots Blade. It doesn't really like follow off of the events of the, fir of the first movie. So you really don't need to have watched Blade one at all. You just give that a miss entirely because it's not very good. Just watch Blade 2, which is, it is not surprising to learn that it is directed by Guillermo del Toro. It feels like it. And it is just so miles in a way better than the first movie. I cannot even put into words how much better it is. And it is, again, one of these where like the imagery, like it is quite a bit. So if you're squeamish, then don't watch it. But it is more sort of art artsy and cartoonish. Um, well, I mean, while still being quite gory and gross. But if you've seen a Guillermo del Toro movie, I think you know what I mean. Or like, it's it's so over the top in its gore and it's like weird grossness that I can't take it too seriously. So I can't be that grossed out by it. And I don't know, Blade just gets to be a slightly more fun character. I mean, he's still Blade, but I don't know. There's just more fun, more like dynamicness in the movie. And it actually has a better story. It has more interesting lore. And it has amazing action. I think it had a much higher budget than the first Blade movie. I mean, as much as Interview of the Vampire is like vampire-y vampires with like cravats and being aristocrats who will sell your blood. Blade is like if vampires were in the Matrix. <laughs> oh, I mean, it's just, it's cool. It's so cool. And the action is honestly so good. If you are a connoisseur of like action choreography, A plus action choreography. So Blade 2, don't watch Blade 1. Watch Blade 2. Next up I have And Then There Were None, the new adaptation. But by new I mean it came out like f at this point like five years ago I think. Um, and it was made for TV. So I think it's in the US they split it into two parts and in the UK they split it into three parts. I mean it's the same story it's just like where they did the cutting off. But it's an adaptation of Agatha Christie's book And Then There Were None. And this this like screenwriter and director or this team, they took an already amazing book. And the book already is dripping with atmosphere and suspense and just mood. And they just, through the cinematography and through like the slight changing of the order of the information that's delivered to you. And they do, I mean, they change the story a little bit, but they just really capture that, that feeling of dread and isolation 
and suspicion. I mean, the book already does that and they just really amped it up in how they shot it and how they did it that it is quite chilling. It's honestly very chilling. Even if you know the story and even if you've watched the adaptation several times, it's still chilling. So well done. I mean, if you haven't read the book, I recommend the book for any time of year, but spooky season is all a great, a great time of year. And if you don't know what And Then There Were None is, again, it's a book by Agatha Christie and it's about this island where all these strangers are invited to come to this island. And then when they arrive at the island, they, I mean, none of them really knows why they were invited there. And then they begin to die and they don't know who is doing it or why. But there is a little rhyme that's, there's different versions of it. I think the original one was like, not okay. <laughs> there's different movie adaptations that have also changed, but it is sometimes it's 10 little soldiers. Sometimes it's 10 little Indians. Sometimes it's 10 little something that the original one was that we're not going to say what it was, but the, there's a little rhyme and it's like part of the island's lore. So they, you know, all iterations of the story, they, they learn what that rhyme is where it's like, there were 10 little whatever's playing and then one had X happen to them. And then there were nine and nine little whatever's were doing whatever. And then they had X happen to one of them and then there were eight until blah, 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 blah. And then there were none. Um, and that's basically what's happening to them. They're all dying and they seem to be following this rhyme. Who's next? Um, and in, they're on this island that can't get off and no one knows why they're there. And this house is pretty isolated itself where they're at. They can't trust each other because no one knows who invited them and if it's one of them. So it's just, a, it's a great book. And then this adaptation of it, it, it does such a good job capturing that vibe of like, who is it though? Is it you? Who's next? Oh, so, so good. Continuing on with Agatha Christie, uh, my next recommendation is Poirot Halloween or Poirot's Halloween. I don't know if it's possessive. There's a uh, Poirot, the TV series um, with David Suchet playing the eponymous detective. The episode that is the Halloween episode where there is a Halloween murder mystery is a wonderful spooky season thing to watch where again, you have uh, jack-o'-lanterns and like spooky children's games and you have a murder. It just, what more could you ask for? And a murder mystery set at Halloween with Poirot himself there to solve it. That's perfect. Next up I have Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. I really love Pride and Prejudice and Zombies just in general. Low-key my favorite version of Pride and Prejudice. But also zombies. I actually, I mean I hate zombies. I think I've mentioned that before like when I talked about Dread Nation. Something about putting zombies though in a historical time period, which is what Dread Nation does, and is what Pride and Prejudice and Zombies does, I just don't mind. Plus those movies are quite camp, or that movie is quite campy. So, I mean, an actual zombie movie, I did watch and I did like 28 Days Later, but like, but no, but no. So Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, I think is like a fun, messing around with the story of Pride and Prejudice, like fun use of some of the original text and dialogue. Charles Dance and Lena Headey, or Heavey, or however you say it, is in it. And Lily James is great is as Lizzie, and it's it's so good. And it's so uh, gothic and vibey and spooky because there's, there's zombies. I don't think I need to explain why this is on the list. Next up, I have The Black Cauldron, which is one of Disney's most underrated movies, partly because Disney themselves shafted it and and butchered it and there's like okay there's lots of videos on youtube you can watch about how like the original animations for it were like gutted by the studio for no reason i mean they had reasons but not good reasons and then they had to scramble to kind of like make it still work and even though the story couldn't be the same anymore and then they had to like rush the animation for those parts and then, then they didn't even like promote the movie because they thought no one would like it rant aside the movie we got even though it wasn't as good as it could have been because of aforementioned reasons it's still a good movie it could have been great. It was still a really good movie. And The Horned King? Have you seen The Horned King? That is the scariest Disney villain. I don't care what you say. And he's literally like his his master plan, like his 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 villainous evil whatever is to raise up skeletons, raise up an army of the dead to take over the world basically. And our heroes have to try to prevent him from doing that. So again, I think it's clear why this is a good spooky season movie. Next up, I have one that you've probably seen, definitely heard of, The Addams Family. I love The Addams Family. I think the movie is so good. I think the casting is perfect. I think the jokes are perfect. The vibes are perfect. The visual gags are perfect. It's a really fun, like for the whole family type movie. Uh, and I never really get sick of it. It's one of those ones like Casper where like, I'm sure you've heard of Casper. I'm sure you've heard of The Addams Family, but you know what? They're so good. So I just want to remind you, don't forget to watch 
The Addams Family, because it's really good. Next up, I have Crimson Peak, another Guillermo del Toro movie. And if you haven't seen Crimson Peak, it's kind of in the category of Penny Dreadful, where like the entire thing is an aesthetic. <laughs> where, I mean, honestly, Crimson Peak is like if a gothic Victorian Pinterest board became a movie. <laughs> Because, I mean, it, it has a plot. Don't get me wrong. It has a plot. But, like, that's not really, like, the point. The point is to look at amazing sets and these amazing costumes and these, like, very artistically rendered bizarre ghosts and specters and, like, how red that blood looks against that pale skin and that snow. That's it. Like, that's... It's seeing Tom Hiddleston in victorian garb like that's that's what crimson peak is about that's the plot <laughs> it is again it's r i think it's it's got to be r-rated maybe it's not i don't know but it is another one where like if you are very scream squeamish it is actually quite bloody and um there are it is some sort of like violent troubling imagery that again that if that's gonna bother you it's it's a little much but overall it's not really a scary movie it's not the point of it the point of it is to be like artsy and beautiful looking in a very like gothic aesthetic so if you feel like watching an entire movie of aesthetic crimson peak that's the one <laughs> next up i have an unpopular opinion um haunted mansion the disney movie based on the ride this is like miss peregrine's except it happened last year i remember seeing it in theaters with my family and all of us being like that was garbage and then last year we were looking for a halloween movie to watch that we didn't have to pay extra for like we didn't want to rent it we we're like well what's available to stream and we were like well haunted mansion and we were like but that movie's terrible and but i was like it has been so long since we've seen haunted mansion it would be like a new movie and we couldn't really think of anything else to watch so we we're like all right whatever we put it on we can always turn it off and all of us were like it's that movie still isn't great but it's a lot better than we remembered it was actually a good time and i still wish they made like a proper haunted mansion movie that's like legit like like the best kind of like like a crimson peak <laughs> kind of movie but for what it is haunted mansion has some funny moments it definitely has so many nods to the ride i recently learned which makes me like it even more that a lot of things in the movie are actually uh nods to original concepts for what was the haunted mansion walkthrough before it was ever going to be a ride and then the original ride before they changed a lot of it so there are a lot of things that i didn't even realize in the movie are actually nods to that so that's really cool if you're just like into like theme park lore which like i kind of am yeah it's not nearly as bad as i remember so it may not be as bad as you remember so try watching it again um and then if you don't like it you can always start it off next up i have something super super short like literally like five minutes and it is a short i think it was like one of those cartoons that they used to like do in the movie theater when way way back in the day you went to the movie theater and you got a cartoon and a newsreel and whatever so this this short is called trick or treat and it's available on disney plus now that's how i first saw it last year and it's a huey dewey and louie and it's just this little short about them wanting to get candy from donald duck and he's ref he keeps insisting on giving tricks instead of treats and this like old witch takes pity on the boys who just want candy and they're so cute in their little costumes so then like the witch helps them pull pranks on donald because he's being mean and not giving them candy and that's the whole thing and it's the cutest thing and it's only like 10 minutes if that long anyway I, I mean i think it's worth watching slightly longer but still quite short next on my list is garfield's halloween everyone always watches the peanuts the great pumpkin charlie brown and like honestly it's a news fest i'm sorry but the great pumpkin charlie brown is so boring garfield's halloween honestly kind of scared me when i was a kid and like a little bit now like a little bit like not actually but like it's kind of creepy i mean it's like what like half an hour or whatever however long a garfield episode is and you know it's garfield and odie going trick-or-treating and then going off course and then ending up in this like haunted riverside lakeside i mean this this haunted place and there's like this really creepy guy there and there's this like whole story about like returning from the dead for the buried treasure on this like on halloween night from however many years ago and like they're just like caught in the middle of it and Odie is so cute and doesn't understand what's happening and just wants candy and then he gives it all to Garfield and uh Garfield is Garfield but uh it's honestly like a spooky little story that I think is really good so yeah don't forget about Great Pumpkin watch Garfield next up I have Lock and Key um the adaptation of the graphic novels that they did on Netflix I uh, still want to read the graphic novels I haven't but the adaptation is really, really good. And if you don't know what Lock and Key is, um, it's this this family who the father died 
uh, in tragic circumstances. So now they've, for a change of scenery, because they need to sort of reset their lives, they move into what I guess was the father's family home, a sort of ancestral home in this like really small town, rural kind of area. And it's this really old kind of mansion house. And they begin to discover that there are all these sort of like magical keys that open magical doorways, but it's not magical in like a, wow, it's magical. It's kind of dark and sinister and these magics are like possibly nefarious and there are other people after these keys and so when the kids start finding them then the people are after the kids because they want the keys so it's like the house is a really cool like uh setting to be in and there's this, the mysteries of the keys and the the drama and the suspense and the danger of the keys and the doorways and the magic and all of that so yeah i really enjoyed it and i'm excited for the next season, which I'm pretty sure they're gonna have at some point. Next up, I have Riverdale. <laughs> I'm just trying to sneak it in there because I love Riverdale, but Riverdale is also kind of creepy. The very first season is about a murder that takes place in the town. Subsequent seasons have other scary overarching plots like cults and um, there's a dark academia arc in the fourth season with like with murder. So there's always like investigation of something and there's like very creepy people that live in the town of Riverdale and they're always encountering unsettling creepy things and they're always going to the morgue to look at bodies. And um, I'm just, I mean, it's pretty dark, honestly. So, you know, just maybe watch Riverdale. Next up I have Stranger Things, which again, you've definitely heard of it. I don't think you don't know what it is. I don't think I need to super explain why it's on my list because I mean, it's basically a horror show with like a very scary alien creature thing. I mean, alien just in terms of it is alien to us. I mean, it's not from outer space. It's from like a different dimension from the upside down. Here's your reminder to watch Stranger Things. Next up, I have the movie Seven with Brad Pitt and Morgan Freeman. If you've never seen it, um, you should because it's a really good movie. It is also, it is very dark and it is quite rated R, very like gory and yeah, not for the faint of heart. Like if you're squeamish, don't watch that. But um, it is about like a serial killer and Brad Pitt and Morgan Freeman are investigating the serial killer. And the killer is, the, the, the pattern of the killer is killing people based on the seven deadly sins and killing them in the manner that like punishes the sin. And it is very dark and twisty and kind of gross. But again, very dark. So a good spooky season watch. Uh, on the lighter side, next up I have Young Frankenstein by Mel Brooks. I say by like it's a book, but if you've never seen Mel Brooks's Young Frankenstein, it makes fun of all those terrible Frankenstein movies that totally butchered Mary Shelley's phenomenal story. And I think it actually of all Mel Brooks movies, it might be the one that has best stood the test of time and best lived up in terms of like the jokes still landing and the humor is still landing and nothing being too offensive. It's both making fun of that type of movie while also being enough that type of movie that it's perfect for spooky season because it's this, you know, black and white movie with this like haunted castle and this mysterious laboratory and howling wolves in the night. I mean, they're making jokes about all that, but it also has that vibe. So if you haven't seen it or haven't seen it in a while, Watch Young Frankenstein. Two more left. I have uh, Carnival Row, which is a show that uh, Amazon did a couple years ago. And I really hope they do another season. I haven't heard for sure that they have or haven't planned to do it. But um, it's it feels like it was based on a book because there's such amazing lore going on. But it, it kind of has this sort of Dickensian industrial city vibe. But there's also the, these sort of fey creatures and other kind of magical beings that exist. But they're all kind of second class citizens in this sort of city that feels like industrial London. And so you have like, there's there's this dark sinister mystery of like someone killing these creatures. And then you also have all these creatures around that add, you know, that kind of like Penny Dreadful almost vibe to it. And it has a really great story and amazing lore again, amazing cinematography, great performances, asks some interesting sort of like social questions. And overall, it's just like a really excellent show. I don't feel like I've seen a lot of people talk about it and it's really good. And last on my list is Ruby and the Smoke, which um, is based on a book and it is a murder mystery, one of the Sally Lockhart murder mysteries. And it is very dark and sinister. And she's, it's very, it's, she's in the Victorian era and she's solving a murder. But like, the vibe of it and her there's some very sort of like creepy people involved and it's her investigating it and just like the clothing of the era and then there's this the fact of there being a jewel that is important to this somehow and she's kind of personally tied to it and i just think it's a good fall spooky season type of thing to watch 
So yeah, that's all 30 things on my list. I definitely have probably like 10 more things, but that'll do. So let me know in the comments down below. If you've seen these things, if you want to see these things, if you plan to see these things, whatever you want to let me know. I post videos on Saturdays, other random times as well, but definitely Saturdays. So like and subscribe. Join my Patreon if you feel so inclined. And I'll see you when I see you.